Obviously, there's a very good reason why I'm playing this song. For those of you who have uh, read the readings, would probably have worked well. You don't have to work it out because it's, it's spelled out very clearly <laughs> to you. But for those of you who haven't read this, just uh, enjoy the song, I guess. I mean, I, I think you get the idea, right? You get this sort of... Uh, what's the what's the exact era this is emulating? Okay, it's, uh, Mark Fisher says it's 60s. We should probably trust him. Yeah, so it's it's got a 60s sort of sound to it, and... Uh, so it's, it, I mean, it's funny when I when I first read this part because I, I think I read this in. No, it wasn't. It wasn't when the song came out, obviously, because the song came out in two thousand six and the book came out two thousand nine or twenty twelve or something. Uh, no, twenty fourteen. Right. Wow. So it's many years after the song, but then. Uh, so this this is the part I'm talking about, right? So in uh, Ghost of My Life, the second reading that I've assigned for this week, uh, Fisher, I mean Fisher talks about a lot of his uh, personal uh, experiences. So it, it, I mean you, you could see from the like from the books from from his books, his books are not entirely sort of you know, not sort of rigidly academic. You know, academically centered. You know, his books are sort of more sort of personal musings, but very academically inclined. It's, I don't know. It's sort of like that. That sort of hybrid. So it's, it's not like your. It's not like your usual academic books. Uh, lots of personal experience. So this is uh, the time when when he was walking down the, the shopping mile and, uh, and and he heard he heard this song for the for the first time he heard this amy winehouse song for the first time am i still playing in the background no am i uh, no right so for those of you who know it obviously knows what obviously know what it is that right but uh for fisher he didn't know right uh when Fisher was walking down the shopping mall, or doing, I don't know, I don't know what he was doing. He doesn't really say. But you he heard it, he thought it was a, um, obviously it was a cover version, which it is. Right? It's a cover version of a, of a, of an earlier song by this, I believe is a band, the, the Zootons. Uh, let's see, Valerie. Zootons. So this is what it should have sounded like, right? So he knew this song, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't know about the the Amy Winehouse Mark Ronson cover, which ironically was actually the more popular one. So I, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how uh, Mark Fisher actually knew the the lesser known song. The, the I think I think this original song came out in two thousand one or something. I probably should have done the research. Zootons. Well, I call it research. It's just Google Google search really. So. Uh, Research in the twenty first century, I suppose. Uh, Two thousand six, even. Wow. Okay. So yeah. Wait. Hang on. So the song. Oh, so the Amy Winehouse song came out in twenty uh, two thousand seven. I remembered it wrong. I, I thought it was two, uh, just two years off. Anyway, you get the idea. So so he knew the he knew the original song, and he thought it was some sort of some sort of cover. But then he was thinking to himself, right? Hang on a minute, because it sounds so sixties, right? So this one that that I'm hearing must have been the original, right? And the Zootons one must have been the cover, and it must have been something that I didn't I didn't know. Right? I being Mark Fisher, obviously. So that was his uh, experience walking down the shopping mall one day, and uh, it very much sort of represents what we what we'll be covering, like the main theme we'll be covering today. Um, I mean, this theme kind of com it has kind of come up like every now and then in our course right i mean if you want to understand it in terms of the baudrillardian simulation it works i guess it works and uh you know the the, the week we talked about la la land you know kind of kind of resonates with those points uh you know how the new draws inspirations from the old so this is basically what what's happened there you know, the, the amy winehouse mark ronson cover it takes a slightly older song right it's just one just one year off just one year pre previously the, the release date so 
but they changed the entire sort of aesthetic. I think I asked the same question last time. Right? Can you still call it aesthetic when it's music? But anyway, the sound, right? They changed the sound entirely to sounding like a like a sort of a, a 60s song. So much so that Mark Fisher himself being quite accustomed, very um, very knowledgeable in music as well, because he has written about music in his earlier career as a as an even more hybrid sort of academic. You know, he, he he wrote about things in a, in a more sort of casual, even more casual way, before he uh, turned into more sort of academically centered books. So like this one here, we're reading the first reading I've assigned: Capitalist Realism. Is there no alternative? Uh, Two thousand nine, and then the next one. This one is more sort of uh, more personal, as you can see from the title. It talks about his own problems with depression. Uh, mental health and all that, which incidentally was was what brought him to his own death. He he took his own life in yeah, like I said, he took his own life in 2017, uh, allegedly because of his uh, problems of depression. It, it's kind of interesting to look at this guy. Like he's like his whole career has been like one project to to sort of justify his own suicide. Basically, like there is no there is no future, right? Everything is uh, everything is finished, which is which sounds like uh, Francis Fukuyama's idea, right? We talked about last week. Like I, I think I already said it last last week. How this week's topic is kind of like a mirror image of the Francis Fukuyama thesis, but like the exact opposite of it. Like you know, when if if you look at Francis Fukuyama's thesis as the positive way to look at it, then Mark Fisher's way is definitely. A negative spin on pretty much the same thing you know the, there is no future right the the future has ended roundabout way to say that the history has ended um, uh, so in early 2000s he, he was into blogging when blogging wasn't wasn't even that popular I mean yeah it was starting to get popular at the time like early 2000s only the really cool kids would do blogging uh, obviously he was one of those and uh, he, he called his blog uh, K-Punk and the K stood for I think it's Kyber I don't know it's it's Greek it's basically it's basically just Greek for for cyber the the, the root word for for cyber it's basically cyberpunk but it's not the cyberpunk that you may or may not be familiar with but cyber basically cyber just means I don't I actually don't know what cyber means but sort of uh, the, the the concept of being networked and the concept of having technologies to I don't know enhance stuff so it doesn't necessarily have to be like the sort of oversaturated colors you know that sort of aesthetic that you associate cyberpunk with today and punk is uh, I mean punk has a has a connotation of rebellion I mean you have punk rock you have uh, punk fashion you know, like Vivian Westwood and all those people all, all of those people are associated with 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 punk punk is just alternative culture just you know rebellious against the the mainstream that sort of things so, so Mark Fisher has always been into those sort of things and so that's kind of his background he took he took his own life uh with the justification of of uh, of pretty much the, the the things that he's he's been talking about throughout his own throughout his uh, own career throughout his entire life, which centers around this this idea ontology. I think we we I think I talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, this word came from uh, good old Derrida. Um, again, it's 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 a combination between two words. It's it's to haunt, uh, i.e., like having a ghost to. To haunt you, right? And the the other half of this word is ontology. So, uh, oh, I should probably just ontology, right? So that's the other word. So haunt plus haunt plus ontology. Where's the plus sign there? Yeah, there you go. Um, so in the beginning of uh, Marx and Engels uh, communist manifesto right the, the the first line i believe it was the first line because i didn't i haven't actually read it myself like a lot of pseudo intellectuals who claim to <laughs> claim to have read the stuff but they haven't, they haven't actually read it um, the first line was uh, there's 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 been a specter looming in europe the specter of communism or whatever so that's sort of the, the famous first line 
of first lines in in uh, in the communist Fan- manifesto and derrida sort of took that sort of sort of uh sort of played on that and and said that there is a, a specter of marx looming in uh I don't think he actually said in in Europe, but in uh, anyway, it's similar similar. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter, All right? There's a specter of Marx because I think I said it last week. It was it, the, the background was the the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989, which led you know people like Fukuyama to think that you know history has ended, uh, communism has been defeated, capitalism has has won, you know, all that sort of thing. And Derrida took it in a different direction albeit you know, it's the starting point is still the same like you know marxism is dead communism is dead so there is a specter of marx which is it's kind of interesting because if you if you look at the original right the original being coming from marx and engels the the specters because i think i think i, I always said this last time like specter ghost ghost is something that's already dead so it its existence is in the past right and then it's it's it, it's died then it becomes a ghost, but then the ghost is paradoxical, right? It it it, it obviously is something that exists, right? Otherwise, it, it 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 it's something that you can feel at least. It it's it's a something, right? The ghost is a something, but to for something to become a ghost, he had he or she or it has to cease to exist, right? So it it sort of has that sort of paradoxical meaning. And if you look at the the use of this, this word spectre by Marx and Engels, you could you you can sort of feel that they 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 mean the word in the opposite direction because the communism hasn't or hadn't arrived yet when they were writing when they were writing that book they were they were the specter of communism is not something that's 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 been dead right it's, it's something that hasn't arrived yet that's kind of you know how how they meant it so if you look at it it's kind of interesting the specter of Marx I don't know. You have to ask Derrida. It, I, I, I think it kind of takes on both meanings, right? The specter of Marx meaning Marx is dead, and also the ideas of Marx uh, haven't arrived yet. I think it has that sort of double meaning, which is very Derrida, Derridean, right? like I said last time. Uh, so Mark Fisher, so the third step. Now you know you have the original from Marx and Engels, and then Derrida took it, you know, played on it, and uh, and then you have Mark Fisher sort of adapting this idea of the ontology and to comment on the cultural impasse, what he calls the cultural impasse, the failure of the future. Uh, I took I took this phrase from this uh, other article. You could just search what is ontology, Mark Fisher, and it, would, it, it should come up uh, in your Google search. Right, so this is some of the words that Mark Fisher uh, wrote about Derrida and his idea of ontology. This is You can find it in uh, in, in the second reading, Ghosts in... Uh, go, Ghosts. I should probably say ghosts. Otherwise, it would be that. Otherwise, it will. It will refer to the Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, Demi Moore film. Um, Derrida's deconstruction, right? So, it, uh, Fisher outright says that Derrida is a frustrating thinker. I think most, most of you would 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 have gone hooray. You know. You know, there is uh, this academic person who who sort of agrees with most of you, right? You know. Derrida being quite frustrating to understand. I kind of like the guy, so I'm sort of on the on the opposite end of the of the se- of the spectrum. I don't think he's frustrating, so I kind of like his sort of double meaning. Everything has a double meaning, and a double meaning is is always like positive and negative. So you know, you know me, I like that sort of thing. It, uh, a loyally virtue of avoiding any definitive claim. Yeah, there you go. This is this is the stuff that I like, but this is the stuff that a lot of people don't like. You know, if you can't define something. Uh, clearly, then what else can you do? It's a pathology of skepticism. Um, I think by now, right? Because it's the penultimate week. By now, you when you spot these words, you you immediately uh, sort of realize these sort of postmodernist feel, postmodernist uh, ideas. You know, like skepticism, like uh, asking questions of the questions. You know, that sort of thing. It's very. It's all very postmodern, which it's induced hedging. What is hedging? I don't. I don't know if that's a typo or if I just don't know English at all. Let me just go, let me just go check on. Let me just go check on the quote. Uh, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. There you go. Uh, where did I get this quote? Uh, uh, oh, you did say hedging. What is hedging? I don't know. Hedging, infirmity of purpose, and hedging is hedging is a lot of maybes and alternatives. I think. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, infirmity of purpose and compulsory doubt in his followers. So everything points to the same thing, right? You know, skepticism, doubt, uh, you know, questioning the questions, like I always say. Uh, let me just go back to my... So that's what Derrida does, right? What, that's what deconstruction does. That's what ontology, again, by by definite, by extension, that's also what ontology does as well. Uh, it's a successor, according to Fisher. It's a successor to Derrida's previous concepts, like the trace and dif and uh, difference, right? So some of you have written about this in your midterms, and I I really appreciated the the amount of understanding. It's uh, fantastic. Like those earlier terms, it referred to the way in which nothing enjoys a purely positive ex existence. Um, yeah, so if you read, if you actually read how Derrida talks about the the haunting, right? Some, something that haunts. He usually talks about the nature of the image, and uh, yeah, I think it mentions that so something later, something about this later. Uh, one of the repeated phrases in Spectres of Marx is from Hamlet: "Time is out of joint." I'm I think a lot of you know me. I don't really read. I can't read, so I don't. I'm not really familiar with Shakespeare. I try to look for the context of time is out of joint. I can't really find the the context that I'm happy with. Apparently, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean time as we sort of know it. Just out of joint. The it's 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 only the the meaning is only on the phrase out of joint, as in sort of a uh, sort of a medical sense. You know, something is wrong, right? Because I I believe it was. It's, Someone killing someone else, you know, taking the throne or whatever, you know, very Shakespearean, uh, you know, sort of thing, and and that sort of murder, it's it's not natural, and uh, and then you have this character says, uh, the time is out of joint, something is not right, so it's it's not quite how we mean it now when we when we hear time is out of joint, we have con we have images in our heads of, you know, all all kinds of time travel narratives, you know me, time travel guy, so when I look at this. Many possible imaginations is uh, can be possible. Anyway, let's read this quote and just uh, un try to understand more about what ontology is. Is ontology some attempt to revive the supernatural? So you know, calling on the ghost because there is there is this idea of the ghost and spectres and all that. So is it is it just about you know supernatural stuff or whatever? I, I would say it's, it's not really that, or is it just a figure of speech? I, yeah, I would say it's a figure of speech. But let, let me just. Let me just uh, explain this a bit further late, later on. The way out of this unhelpful opposition is to think of ontology as the agency of the virtue of the virtual, uh, with the spectre understood not as anything supernatural, but as that which acts without physically existing. I think the brackets physically is quite quite significant here because, like I said, it's the spectre in the Derridean sense is very paradoxical. It's something that at the same time exists but doesn't exist. But then if you put physically there, there's there's no there's no debate, right? It, it's something that exists but not physically. Right? That solves the that solves the, the the dilemma, I suppose. The great thinkers of modernity like Freud as well as Marx had discovered different modes of this spectral causality. The late capitalist world governed by the abstractions of finance is very clearly a world in which virtualities are effective and perhaps the most ominous spectre of Marx's capital itself. Yeah. Uh, as But as Derrida underlines in his, uh, in this, in I think it's in his interviews in Ghost Dance film, uh, in the Ghost Dance film, I mean, if, if you're, if you, if you're interested in Derrida and if you have a chance to watch it i think it's it's quite it's quite useful the ghost dance film i haven't watched it in full but i've watched bits of it which is where i got his idea from his idea of, about the ontology and how it's mostly about images from um psych psychoanalysis is also signs of ghosts in a way kind of yeah it kind of is a study of how uh, reverberant events in the psyche become revenants or something that comes back right return of the repressed right that's that's what psychoanalysis is about right and uh, apparently marxism is also a kind of a return of a ghost in the form of capital because capital is if you think about it it's, it's very it's virtual it doesn't mean anything it's just a uh, you know just some printed paper i mean now we have like cryptocurrency or you know digital currency or whatever we don't even get those printed papers it's even more virtual than it than it already was right um 
It's all about virtuality. So like I said, if you if you have seen the ghost dance film or or many, many articles that talk about uh, Derrida's appearance in the ghost dance film, then you realize that Derrida uses this idea of ontology to, to comment on the nature of the images. But Fisher just took it to, to comment on the music like that. Uh, that song that I just played earlier, Valerie, by uh, Amy Winehouse and uh, Mark Ronson, with Mark Ronson's production. Uh, images, as far as I remember, there's, there's something very sort of provocative. Like Derrida, in this interview, he, he makes this comment, right, because he's being filmed by a camera, and he, he makes this comment where, you know, I, I'm... I'm I've, he makes this point about perform, perform, performativity, to formativity, so you know how how he how he performs himself, right? How Derrida is playing Derrida, right? Because he's aware that there is a camera looking at him, and he's aware that his image his image will be recorded for someone in the future to look at. So he he needs to play the role of Derrida in order for that to happen, for the recording to happen. So the so there's a dec- discrepancy where the real Derrida is never recorded; it's just the performance of Derrida, you know, something like that. So kind of that there's there is that split right so if you if you think about that split the real Derrida which is never which can never be recorded it's only just the performance the the surface the apparent the appearance of Derrida that's the only thing that can be recorded kind of like what I'm doing here you know I'm aware that there is a camera looking at me and and I don't know maybe my 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 deme- my demeanor is is different from when there is not a camera I will never know I, I try to be uh, as natural as I can, but according to Derrida, this is something that's impossible because you're always aware of the fact that there is there is the future to look at, especially I'm recording my lectures, upload to YouTube, you know, later for for uh, I don't know what they're for basically. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, but I sometimes I look at them late like later on. Uh, I don't know, like there's this other lecture that I'm, that I'm doing for the second time and uh, as a pep- as a preparation I usually just go back to my YouTube channel and look at how I did it the first time and then uh, it's sort of, sort of like having my past self teaching my present self and, and that would be my preparation done so it's sort of convenient this way so I don't know it's out of convenience I suppose um, so that's kind of ont- I, I don't know whether you understand the, the idea of ontology. I mean, I mean, we've read Derrida, so you kind of you, you're kind of immune. You've you've taken the 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 vaccine of Derrida to you, you kind of have a sort of rough understanding of what Derrida is usually about. And and if you think about the image, how there is this performativity. I don't know whether that's even the right word. You know, performance and how that's different from the the real. Derrida, which is why I said it's sort of related to the Baudrillardian concept of like you know, simulation, because it's 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 like the other way to say is is Derrida simulating Derrida, right? Uh, anyway, so another example is this film. I hope uh, I hope this is entertaining. I I quite like this film, although the first time I saw it, I didn't I didn't really like it. But maybe because I was too young when I when I watched it, I was. Uh, I was nineteen, or yeah, I was nineteen back then, so I couldn't couldn't really understand. I couldn't really understand like what 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 is the big deal? Or maybe it, maybe the film came too soon, right? If you look at if you look at the film now, it's it sort of it's sort of more relevant now than than it ever was in, in two thousand in two thousand six when everything was relatively peaceful, apart from nine eleven, obviously. But, uh, look at uh, let's look at this. Um, no, actually, I'll comment on this, and then, and then we'll play the beginning because it, it kind of it kind of uh, talks about that as well. So Mark Fisher uses this film as uh, as the as the first example in the opening of uh, of that other book, Capitalist Realism. This book uh, in your first reading, right? so I'm including the first and the second chapter of this book as your required reading. And he, he he talks about how normal, right? How normal the the sort of the situation d- depicted in Children of Men looks like. You know, it looks normal, but at the same time, it it's futuristic. Because usually, when something is futuristic, you you think of something that's you know, you see flying cars and you know, like bright colors or whatever. Something that you won't see today. But the portrayal of the future 
in children of men is kind of is very is very 2006 you could you could almost you can almost feel like this is set in 2006 but then this isn't something mark fisher says but it's it's something that i just picked up you know it, it, when when you just look at the real when you look at the details right it, talk about mise-en-scene you know and analyzing a film or whatever you look at the details like the really small details and you see that there are some advanced technologies that couldn't have existed in 2006 or even 2021 and those are the little signs you you really have to look to to see the real to to see the real signs that that tell that tell you that this is supposed to be futuristic i believe it's like 20 i think it says it on the on the films let's just let's just watch the film i guess uh See, I think it says it here. After all the logos and the... wow. Day one thousand of the... the Muslim community demands an end to the army's occupation of mosques. The Homeland Security Bill is ratified. After eight years, British borders will remain closed. The deportation of illegal immigrants will continue. Good morning. Our lead story. The world was stunned today by the death of Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet. Baby Diego was stabbed outside a bar in Buenos Aires after refusing to sign an autograph. Witnesses at the scene say that Diego spat in the face of a fan who asked for an autograph. He was killed in the ensuing brawl. The fan was later beaten to death by the angry crowd. Born in 2009, the son of Marcelo and Silvio Ricardo, a working-class couple from Mendoza, he struggled all his life with the celebrity status thrust upon him as the world's youngest person. Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet, was 18 years, 4 months, 20 days, 16 hours, and 8 minutes old. Right, 2027. You can even see some, you know, technologies that are, well, if, if you call them technologies, right? Technologies that aren't, that shouldn't be there, not because they are too far ahead into the future, but they're too, like, way behind in, in history, like, you know, the cars like this. Right, you know, they they shouldn't they shouldn't appear in 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 the streets of London. I believe this is near Borough, near London Bridge. Um, right, they shouldn't appear here. But you see, you see, sort of older technologies, sort of mingled with modern technologies, which is kind of a, a kind of it's a very subtle way of of commenting on that sort of going backwards in in the progression of history and technology and you know all those things it's, you know the idea that we've been talking about throughout this semester i'm sorry i kind of broke the cinematic effect because this is a one smooth continuous shot and yeah <laughs> i kind of broke that effect by pausing it Yeah, that's why I probably shouldn't have paused it there, like because the the, the shocking the the shock of the explosion is is even more shocking. I I don't know my limited vocabulary. Um, you know, it's 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 more emphasized, right? When when the shot is in it's in one continuous take, and you have that that uh, that explosion, which kind of is another subtle comment of of this uh the portrayal of this future right you have something that's very normal you know just a guy getting coffee in the in the cafe you know it's very normal it's it's everyday life you know nothing special happening and then all of a sudden there's an explosion right there's like two extremes combined together which is why i kind of like this opening sequence which uh, 
Fisher did, doesn't really talk about. He talks about in, in another scene. Uh, he, he, yeah, he talks about this other scene where if you if you have seen the film, you you know you know where this is from. You see, uh, actually, I don't have to show it. I don't I don't think um, it's an anachronism basically. Um, so you, know, you see Michelangelo's uh, David, you see Picasso's uh, Guernica, the like the large black and white painting in the background, and then you see Pink Floyd's inflatable pig, like sort of far in the in the in the background. So you, you see art in or quote unquote art from different contexts, from very different times, and collected uh, together in the same place, in the same uh, in the same place in the same time it should be up it should be after this actually yeah there you go so this is uh when when he visits his uh, cousin for a favor you know so that that's Guernica right and there, there's the inflatable pig back there so he's a um so the cousin right the cousin the, the bloke sitting opposite Clive Owen there it's uh it's supposed to be like an art collector and the one thing that catches Fisher's interest is this remark of uh, actually why didn't I why didn't I why didn't I mark this in my notes? There's this remark right in uh, Clive Owen's character when he asks, uh, "There's nobody else to see it, right?" Because you know the the, the premise of this film is that all, for for some unknown reason. Uh, people can't have children anymore which is why you see you know, baby Diego has died aged 18 years how many months how many days you know you see that news in the beginning of the film and you know, why is it why is it tragic because he's the youngest person alive on earth and for 18 years uh, there has not been a single baby being born and this this is the premise of the film right? there's no new baby you see how this how very symbolic the film already is right it, uh, whoever wrote the story and also the filmmakers probably didn't mean it this way but then you see people like Mark Fisher and probably myself as well would take this example as you know it's very emblematic it's very symbolic to to comment on the nature of there is no few there's no creativity Kind of like the the song Valerie that we just we just heard in the beginning of the of the of the lecture, right? Instead of going, instead of creating something entirely new, creativity is kind of lost because it, uh, the 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 makers of that song or the makers of you know, new art or whatever they they take inspirations from the past because there is no longer a future, right? Like it's kind of like there's no longer babies, there's there's no longer new creativity coming out. So this is very very symbolic. In this film as well, uh, so he makes this comment. You know, in a hundred years, there will, there won't be any there won't be anyone seeing these art anymore. What? You kill me. A yeah. hundred years from now, there won't be one sad fuck to look at any of this. What keeps you going? Yeah. You know what it is, Theo. I just don't think about it. He just doesn't think about it. <laughs> so he keeps collecting uh, these arts as a sort of an archive. He's he's sort of keeping these arts in, it's, it's sort of keeping them in sort of this pseudo museum kind of kind of scenario. But there won't be there won't be people around in like uh, in a hundred years to to see these things, right? So why even bother archiving these stuff, right? You know. Because there's there's no babies, right? So there's no no in a hundred years everybody would have died, and if there is no babies, then there will be no humans left on Earth to to see these uh, you know wonderful or otherwise garish. You see you see the the pig is pretty garish. Um, you know pieces of art in the future, nobody nobody's going to see them. So why bother? His reason is I don't think about it. This will be this will come back in uh, I think in a couple of minutes time. <laughs> So just bear that in mind. Um, let's see. So he thinks it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. This is a, apparently this is a phrase that's attributed to Frederick Jameson and Slava Zizek. But, uh, Mark Fisher's doing that that thing that I didn't like when I mark your papers. You know, when you cite something, you don't really cite it specifically. So this is what Mark Fisher has done. So you could you I I don't know you could you could very well just get back at me and say hey there's a legitimate 
uh, academic, you know, a, a much more successful academic than yourself who, who has done this thing that I have done. You know, I've, you know, I, I don't do specific citations, or why should I do specific <laughs> citations when Mark Fisher doesn't do it? Yeah, you could you can argue it this way, but uh, he's Mark Fisher, and he, you you aren't. So. <laughs> and incidentally, that was that was that was the thing that was told to me by uh, by my old supervisor, my old Sifu, when I was when I was uh, when I was doing my PhD. I actually I actually raised this question, like why couldn't I? It wasn't Mark Fisher that I was questioning. I was I was I was asking my my Sifu, right? Why why can't I write like Laura Mulvey? And and uh, and and his answer is kind of like kind of like this dude's answer. I just don't think about it, which is sort of not answering the question at all. His answer was because you aren't Laura Mulvey. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the truth. That's that's the reality. Um. Anyway, uh, capitalist realism. The it's what is capitalist realism, right? Uh, so Mark Fisher. I think I probably should get a move on. Uh, like I always do every week. It's Mark Fisher explains it or attempts to explain it. It's a widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but it's also uh, that it is now impossible to even imagine a coherent, a coherent alternative to it. So, you know, uh, cross reference uh, Fukuyama's sentiment. It's, it's, it is this particular nature of uh, Mark Fisher's thesis. It's very similar, if not the same. As Fukuyama's thesis, you know, Fukuyama says because communism is defeated, it, all all that we've left with is uh, we've been left with is uh, capitalism and uh, liberal democracy and all those things, and hence automatically, it means that this must be the best thing to have, right? That's that's Fukuyama's thesis, right? Hence, the the polishing of it or the 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 moving towards the best version of this you know capitalism and liberal democracy and, and all the rest of it would mean the end of history right that's Fukuyama's uh, thesis right but then Mark Fisher's saying that uh, whereas before in the time of Jameson was sort of in the eighties and stuff where when when you could still see an alternative albeit it's an alternative that's that's failing. Although, like I said before, that, that that's that's not, you know, I I don't really agree with that reading. But we will just leave it at that. You know, communism is something that's failing, so, but you can still see that as an alternative, right? But then now, uh, the now being late twenty, late uh, uh late two thousands, early twenty tens, right? Around about the same time as as now, I suppose. Whereas now you can't see, you can't even imagine an alternative. There's only one thing and one thing only, which is, uh, you know capitalism and neoliberalism and uh, so it's a very pessimistic way of looking at it and uh, there is a part that explains this quite quite eloquently I don't know whether I don't know whether I can find it in the in the in, in the book uh, I don't think it's here Yeah, anyway, I can't find it. But it, it, uh, Mark Fisher says um, you know, he he explains you know even the even the world leaders, even the uh, the leaders from capitalist democratic countries, they they sell you this idea of capitalism as a sort of as a negative themselves as well. As he explains, if you if you've done the reading, you probably know what I'm what I mean. Um, even the capitalist uh, leaders would sell you the idea of capitalism as the only viable option by virtue of not it being the best thing, but it being not as bad as the other thing. I don't know whether you understand that logic, right? Yes, capitalism is bad, but it's not as bad as the other thing. That's that's kind of uh, how Mark Fisher explains the situation there, right? So back when there was still an alternative, right, back in the late... in, in in the 80s when when Jameson made a similar sort of argument and uh, capitalism and democracy were sort of marketed as a as the lesser of the two evils in a way I don't know I probably should have put that there and yeah, put that in the in the notes so from so for the future me who is watching this recording remember to put that in the notes and maybe make it into a PowerPoint yeah just be be a bit less lazy and make it into a PowerPoint. Although I quite I kind of like this free flow kind of approach to lecturing. I don't know. 
it's probably it's probably a very bad on 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 the student side of things but i don't know maybe i'm a bit less considerate than i should be uh, anyway, the the cause of this catastrophe, the catastrophe in the world of this film, is that you know the the women can no longer make new babies. You know, that's the catastrophe. Of of course, you could extend this catastrophe to comment on the nature of culture as well, which is what Mark Fisher is doing. There's no bang. There's no anything, but it's still a catastrophe, right? Uh, which is why it's the exact opposite of Fukuyama's optimistic point of view. Fukuyama is saying that on the whole, it, the human race has made huge progress, and you know, despite all the atrocities like you know terrorism or whatever, you could you still, the human race still has come out better than it was before. Uh, whereas here, Marfish is describing the current situation as the catastrophe, kind of like the catastrophe here, right, where you have, it, it kind of looks normal. That That's the thing. That's the main takeaway, right? Everything kind of looks normal, but something is wrong in the background. So the, the one big thing that's wrong in the background is obviously the women, the women's inability to, to, to make new babies, right? But then even in the aesthetic, right, in how the, the film is, is being being framed right you see the street scenes you see you know like i said you know old older i mean you see how old these cars look and you you still see the same double decker buses as you can see now but they're sort of much older much more tatters and stuff but then you see like these sort of very high tech very transparent screens and all that so you see it it looks normal. It looks like a, a normal street, a normal London street scene in two thousand six. But something's not quite right, right? So even the aesthetic there is is sort of making that that point. <sighs> um, yeah. So the theme of st uh, sterility, right? So un inability to make babies must be read metaphorically. How long can a culture? So he's extending that metaphor that metaphor to comment on the the state of the culture. How long can a culture persist without the new? And hence, he's 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 implying, or he's alluding to the the trend of like bringing the retro. You know, uh, the future harbors only re reiteration and repermutation. No sh no shocks of the new kind of like that that song that I played at the beginning of today's lecture, uh, which is why I insisted on playing that. A culture that is merely preserved is no culture at all. Um, yeah, so kind of like the the paintings and the works of art that the that the cousin uh, keeps in his, I think it's his own house, uh, but then the house is uh, is in the is in the museum. If you, if you guys know where it is, it's actually it's actually Tate Modern. When uh, when you when you see the when you see the film when he arrives at the when he arrives at the guy's house. Uh, like when he passes security, I'm not going to find it. When he passes security, you realize that it's actually uh, Tate Modern. But the film doesn't tell you this. This used to be Tate Modern, or whatever. It, 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 or it could be. I don't know. The film doesn't. The film doesn't say anything. The film just sort of leaves everything unexplained. And sort of leave leave it to the audience to to kind of interpret, right? Which which is why there's this uncanny feeling of everything looks normal, but then something doesn't look quite right. Yeah, kind of is like that as well. Uh, so like like Guernica, like the, the, the Picasso painting in the background is preserved, but then no one will see it in the future. So there will be there will be no context. There's no function, right? The function of the art is to kind of is to let people to see. But then when there is no people left to see because there are no babies anymore, the 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 the, the art lo the art loses its function. And it only exists as a as a sort of an empty icon, right? A culture that is only preserved. But uh, it's doing nothing else, so it's no culture at all. Um, so I think I already explained this because it, it's already happening, right? This it, this thing doesn't just happen in the in the in the universe of Children of Men. This film it is also happening in our culture as well. And he's taking this phrase "slow cancellation of the future" from this other guy, Franco Biffo Berardi. He wrote this book called "After the Future." And Berardi doesn't. Uh, Berardi says he's not referring to the direction of time when he when he t mentions future, but more the this cultural situation, the progressive modernity. Again, you realize after so many weeks of 
very patiently staying with me, you you would have noticed these keywords, right? Progressive. You know how modernity, basically, the idea of modernity is the idea of progress, right? But then postmodernity is not exactly the idea of regress, but there's a lot of regress in in the progress as well. I don't know uh, the cultural expectations that were fabricated during the long period of modern civilization reaching a peak after the Second World War. Yeah. So not so much the direction of time, but I actually don't quite understand this quote because progression is kind of like this, right? If you want to gesture what progression means, it's forward motion, right? Which means the direction of time, right? Because time can only go forward, right? I don't know. I, I see them as the same thing, but this Berardi person clearly sees them as, as different. I don't know. This is kind of interesting, although I don't know whether I've got enough time to talk about this. The immediate temptation here is to fit what I'm saying, Fisher, or what Fisher is saying, into a wearily familiar narrative. It is a matter of the old failing to come to terms with the new, saying it was better in their old day. You, 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 obviously, you will, you will have come across this very often when you have an older guy, probably your parents or whatever. Maybe myself. Maybe I have made similar <laughs> comments. Before that, I had I don't even I don't even realize. But the old people they use they 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 keep saying oh they, it's not it's not as good as how they used to do things. Uh, I mean, look at La La Land for instance. The, the, the people the people who don't like La La Land would say that oh the films the, the films were made films were used to be made in much more you know rigorous way. We used to get stars like. Uh, Gene Kelly, who could actually dance, right? Whereas now we only get you know, crap actors like uh, Ryan Gosling, who can't even sing, who can't dance, who can't play the piano. He's rubbish, right? Things are not as as good as. Uh, just to clarify, I like I like him. So it's it's not my comment. It's just how some other people can comment on the film, right? So this is the usual kind of comments that these old people would 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 say right the new the new is not as good as the old but what mark fisher here is saying is kind of the reverse of that right um you know let me just read on yeah it is just this picture with this assumption that the young are automatically at the leading edge of cultural change that is now out of date uh, rather than the old recoiling from the new in fear and incomprehension, those who ex those whose expectations were formed in an earlier era are more likely to be startled by the sheer persistence of recognizable forms. Ah, so if we take La La Land as an example again, then you will have another group of people looking at it and see, oh, this is a, this doesn't look like a new film, right? Because it, it looks exactly like something that Gene Kelly would do back in the fifties. Right, so you see a persistence of recognizable forms, whereas uh, young when young people look at La La Land, they wouldn't have those connotations of uh, Gene Kelly or whatever, unless you you have seen those, obviously. But uh, I mean, do you remember the 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 film that I I didn't show, but I mentioned many many times, like uh, while we're young, right? The film that I made as I did make it as required viewing, sort of optional. You could maybe I, I I assume most of you still haven't watched that film, but watch it. Especially after taking so many lessons now, being 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 very patient with me. Uh, the one with Kylo Ren, uh, yeah. Although I don't I don't know him as Kylo Ren. I I'm aware that he plays this character called Kylo Ren, but uh, I haven't seen that Star Wars film, so I I don't know him as Kylo Ren. Uh, Adam Driver, right? Yeah, the film. Uh, so he, so Adam Driver plays this young guy, but then he knows about all these old stuff. But his understanding of these old stuff is not the same as uh, the Ben Stiller character's understanding, you know, because the the Ben Stiller character has experienced the thing for real, whereas uh, Kylo Ren has only experienced the old stuff in like the YouTube videos or whatever, you know, like a second hand understanding. So it's it's not the same. So it, it's sort of it, it's sort of resonating with that 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 thing that happened in the in that film, right? So you see how this is slightly it's sort of the opposite of, of old guys saying, Oh it's it's not how it used to be, right? The old the old stuff is better. Well it's uh, kind of the same. I mean old the old stuff is still better that's why the new stuff looks like the old stuff, right? But you know, the result is different, right? The new, 
when when people say oh it's it's not as good as it is is not as good as how they used to be when when people make that sort of judgment that the new thing doesn't look anything like the old thing right but now the new thing looks exactly like the old thing so but you make a similar uh comment i don't know um so this is how he uh characterizes the the, the sort of the, the the times that we live in in the 20th century is new newness was infinitely available there's an infinite possibility of opportunities or whatever it's kind of resonates with the with the with the label of boomers right if you know if you know the term boomers that's that's sort of that's sort of the the inf i mean if you want more justification of calling those people boomers you could you could you could use this right because they are they were born in in a time when everything was still new that the new was still infinitely available infinitely possible whereas people like i think i'm in the same generation as, as you in this in this debate you know you have uh, gen y and millennials and all that we live in the 21st we grow up in the 21st century where there is a crushing sense of finitude and exhaustion and a sense of an end basically kind of like you know, mark fisher mark fisher would agree that there is an end, there is a sense of end there uh, it's 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 very apparent in the music that uh, it's not just Valerie, it's not just this track. He's he's bringing other he's bringing other examples as well. I have my own example, but I think I'll play it at the end because it's it's kind of not very related. Well, it, I think it is related, but I'll I'll show it later. In I'll show it at the end if we still have time. Back to the Future, which is very related to. I mean, Mark Fisher didn't mention Back to the Future at all. It's just it's just me being the time travel guy, kind of make make that sort of association also for the lols we may we may have some lols at the end i don't know uh meanwhile he uh fisher uses this uh 70s bbc show called sapphire and steel to explain this point of anachronism of how you know the the new and the old are jumbled together and uh, you know, I, I can't find the exact episode on, on youtube maybe maybe if i spend more time on it I, I could find it but it's not necessary you could just read on you could just read mark fisher's uh, uh, description he, he he writes he writes very well obviously um to, it, it's almost like you you have already watched the episode where just by reading his words um time gets mixed up jumbled up to you making no sense uh kind of recalling that shakespearean phrase you know time is out of joint in the in quite a literal sense right um life continues but time is somehow stopped 21st century is marked by the same anachronism and inertia which afflicted sapphire and steel in their final adventure ah so this is something that happened to the show as well because apparently the show was axed in the middle so there was like this cliffhanger where uh the two protagonists called sapphire and steel they they were caught in this cafe like structure where there is no time or time has been suspended or whatever it's very very doctor who kind of thing i mean it's, i mean it's coming from oh, it wasn't from bbc i believe it was from uh uh another tv station itv because back then there was a, there were only itv and bbc of, of course bbc was doing doctor who back then so they it would be stupid to make a similar show <laughs> in the, on on the same uh, on the same channel so it must have been the opposite the opposite channel anyway um yeah very it's very doctor who if you're aware of doctor who it's you know it, it's in, in in a cafe where the cafe is it has got this 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 thing going on where time is suspended you have new and old and it's jumbled together and and these two protagonists are stuck there and they can't do anything and that's sort of the hip, the cliffhanger that ends that that ended that series but then the show got axed and you know it which is kind of interesting to mark fisher how you know the story itself it's it, it, it's never resolved and it it's sort of um it, the same thing happens to our culture as well it's it's suspended in time right there's no time now it, new and old jumbled together and the, the, we can't resolve this because the show has been axed or in other words the future has been cancelled right um meanwhile uh there's this other guy simon reynolds uh i probably should have included his reading but i'm not really that familiar with with reynolds's work so i can't really say but he's he's written this book called retromania where he's, he's making a similar sort of point right how you know, there's new and old jump put together there's no there's no future futures cancelled blah 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 he calls it retromania you know, if you just um 
if you're interested in the topic, you could sort of compare Mark Fisher's reading and Simon Reynolds's reading. Anachronism is now taken for granted. Yeah. Case in point would be the the Valerie track that I just played earlier, or the or the other track that I played uh, even before Valerie. For those of you who weren't here, I played uh, what's it called? Uh, Jump, right? Jump from uh, Van Halen. Madonna, apparently Madonna has made a, has made a uh, the song with the same name. Yeah, Van Halen. You you know you know that song, right? So this song was from 1980, but if I play it now, or I'm sure this has been used many, many times in like, I don't know, adverts and stuff as a as a sort of neither contemporary nor old song. I don't know if you catch that sort of feel, like the old and the new sort of jumbled together. There's no the time doesn't mean anything anymore for a track like Jump or uh take on me by aha you know all those all those songs or never gonna give you up you know uh you know rick rolled sorry you got you you guys got rick rolled you know all those like 80s classic songs they when they come up yes obviously you you realize that they are from they were from the 80s but they are sort of contemporary as well in their uses so that sort of anachronism is now taken for granted so this is a this is a simon reynolds uh sentiment Ooh, let's see. Well, probably not so much. So, the power of capitalist realism. Oh, I didn't explain this. So when when he explains what capitalist realism is, is the inevitabil inevitability, right? The lack of choice, the lack of alternative for, you know, for another system, for culture or politics or whatever to, to run, right? That's that's what he means by realism. So realism in, in this sense is not, op it's not the opposite of fake, but it's... Uh, inevitability, to quote Agent Smith in uh, in the Matrix. I mean, if you go back and watch the Matrix films, and when Agent Smith says inevitability, now you you see there's a there's a slightly different meaning to the word. That that's how I see it anyway. Because now, because now after I've read all these things, and when I watch the, the Matrix films, and when Agent Smith says it's the it's the sound of inevitability you know it it sounds cool obviously but then it's if you look at it from a sort of cultural studies point of view it's it's actually talking about this the capitalist realism there's no alternative you have to suck it up you have to accept it there's no alternative you can't even imagine an alternative uh anyway where is it right so the power of this the capitalist realism uh, derives in part from the way that capitalism subsumes and consumes all of previous history. One effect of its system of equivalence, i.e. money or capital, which can assign all cultural objects, whether they are religious, iconography, pornography or das Kapital, a monetary value. Right. Uh, it's all in the name of system of equivalence. Right. They all, they all have equal value. You know, that's that's sort of how capitalism works. Everything can be assigned an equal value, i.e., a measure of money. Um, but it it was Marx and Engels's critique um, that you know capitalism is well, I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it, it's the it's the ca it's the characteristic of capitalism how they change the idea of personal worth into exchange value. That's how capitalism works. So, but I mean, I, I can put this question to you. Can you think of another way to, right? Can you think of another way to to solve this equation? Right, personal worth equals exchange value. I actually, I, I keep thinking about this question constantly. I can't really, I can't really think of anything apart from, you know, giving money. Like, let's say, for instance, if 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 you've got a friend who does you a, f a favor, right, and you want to say thank you. Right, but then that thank you, that sentiment of the thank you, it it's, it can't be it can't be represented. Well, sure, it can be represented by a card or something, but it doesn't it doesn't show, right? It it doesn't really represent the the amount the the amount of thank you, so to speak, the the size of the thank you. So how do you measure the size, the amount of the thank you that you want to say to the to the friend? You probably buy them a, a, you know a present or something, which needs money or you just flat out give them money or this is basically how you know transactions work right you don't need you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be friend maybe friend is a bad example in this case but you know you ask someone to to do your service right like for instance my car 
my car needs repair, right? And then I, I give it to the mechanic to repair the car, right? And then he repairs it. And this is something that I can't do. Obviously, I'm not a mechanic, so I'm giving the car to a mechanic to repair it because he has the skill and he's repaired it. He's, it looks like nothing has ever happened to it, right? And I feel an enormous amount of thank you, but I can't show it, right? I can't show it by a car. What, what can I show it? Well, how can I show it? Of course, by the, you know, by the enormous amount of money that I end up giving the, the mechanic, right? Yeah, so, and the extension of this exchange, this simple idea of the exchange value would lead to the neoliberal idea of the free trade. Uh, it's free to trade anything uh, as long as it's equal value, right? And, uh, and if, if that's being, you know, overdone, then you have things like exploitation. I think this is the thing that I keep mentioning. It's, it's sort of like Marxism 101, how the you know, workers are being exploited, blah, 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 because the, because personal worth is not properly represented anymore. So, this, you know, this kind of chain is very useful to think about how capitalism, capitalism works, right? You know, personal worth, it's trans translated as exchange value, which is used for to justify free trade and to and in order to uh, and free trade is the thing to justify exploitation that's basically i think that's a easy way to understand it i don't know uh capitalism is what is what is left when beliefs have collapsed at the level of ritual or symbolic elaboration and all that is left is the consumer spectator trudging through the ruins and the relics uh i don't know why i noted this down but uh but yeah you know collapsing of beliefs it kind of reminds us of uh you know the enlightenment this is what enlightenment brought right and the postmodernist thought would look at enlightenment and think and think that something is not quite right in the enlightenment and you know if you, if you think about capitalism is what comes out at the end of enlightenment because of the breaking down of beliefs right and then you need something else to believe in and you be what do you what else do you believe in you believe in system of equivalence right and you believe in the exchange in the reliance of exchange value if something that's if something if something is more expensive that means that must mean that that thing is better right you know that's sort of like a religious belief if you think about it right? you, you have a lot of these like quote-unquote stupid consumers when they when they try to buy new when they try to buy something new like a commodity or like uh, the example i usually like to say is the phone right? for those who don't know about it don't know anything about phones would we'll just look at the the price and we we'll just go for the most expensive one if they can afford it right the most expensive one must mean is the best but if you think about it is it is it, is it equivalent though it probably isn't uh, I think I might need to skip this or maybe yeah no I'll just look at page five and see what's going on there uh, yeah this is engagement Ah, this is where that sentiment comes from. So yeah, let me just read this. Yet this turn from belief to aesthetics, from engagement to spectatorship is held to... Or maybe it's too small for you guys to read this. Um, where am I? Uh, is held to be one of the virtues of capitalist realism in claiming, as Badiou puts it, to have delivered us from the fatal abstraction fatal abstractions inspired by the ide ideologies of the past capitalist realism presents itself as a shield protecting us and i'm interested in this idea of the shield how capitalism acts as a shield to protect us from the perils opposed by belief itself right i think i kind of explained this already like how the collapse in beliefs like what enlightenment did in history uh, breaking down religious beliefs right and then it's being replaced by some other quote unquote religious beliefs, right? You know, the more expensive one must mean the better one, right? That sort of thing. Um, the attitude of ironic distance proper to postmodern capitalism is supposed to Im uh, immunize, immunize us against the seductions of uh, fanaticism, lowering our expectations, we are told, is a small price to pay for being protected from terror and totalitarianism. 
We live in a contradiction, but you has observed a brutal state of affairs, profoundly inegalitarian, where all existence is is evaluated in terms of money alone. Right? We we all and we all know this. Right? You you're living in capitalism in the entire world. I don't I don't know. Maybe even in North Korea, it still kind of works this way. Right? You know the existence is evaluated in terms of money alone uh, is presented to us as ideal right this is an ideal way to to value a, a, an existence of a human being right the like how much he's worth or how much he's being paid right for instance i'm not being paid enough obviously i think i i think i'd make that very clear <laughs> I, I think I've said this. I think I've said that for at least a couple of times in this in this class. Uh, maybe intentional. I don't know. To justify their conservatism, the partisans of the established order cannot really call it ideal or wonderful. So even the, even the establishment knows it. Right? It's not the most ideal way to to evaluate to to evaluate someone's worth by money alone. But uh, so instead, they have decided to say that all the rest is horrible. Right. So this is where it comes from. So maybe I, I probably shouldn't have taken the time to explain this earlier without this quote. Uh, sure, they say we may not live in the condition of the perfect goodness, but we are lucky that we don't live in the condition of evil. Our democracy is not perfect, but is better than the bloody dictatorships. Capitalism is unjust. We know this, but it's not criminal like uh, Stalinism. We let millions of Africans die of AIDS, but we don't make racist nationalist declarations like uh, Milosevic. Uh, I don't exactly know what Milosevic has said, the declarations, but uh, I, kind of, I, I don't know. We kill Iraqis with our airplanes, but we don't cut their throats with machetes like they do in Rwanda. It's very provocative. Like, you know, it kind of makes me... In make me very interested in this guy but you i haven't really read anything by but you but you know this is very provocative you, do you see how this sort of negative way to to frame the the supposed allure of capitalism right so we we all know this we all know capitalism is not perfect but it's at least it's better than that other thing right you, like i said before um Right, so the realism here is that inevitability, you know, here, analogous to the uh, deflationary perspective of depressive, of a depressive who believes that any positive state, any hope, is a dangerous illusion. So it's, so if you think about it this way, right, it's a lack of hope. Right, under capitalism, is everything is there's no hope, there's no positive state because it, it's just the lesser of the two evils. It's just less bad than the other thing, right. You can't you can't think of things in in terms of being good, but in in terms of being not as bad as the other thing. Um, at least that's what Mark Fisher believes, and uh, obviously Alain Badiou, who, uh, whom he quotes. Uh, later, he comments on Fukuyama's thesis as well, and he ha he has a different reading than mine. I think his his is more you know more nuanced, right? Because he when I say his is triumphalist, i.e celebrating on the, the uh, on the supposed achievement that that the human race has achieved hence you know everything is all good and history should end at this point blah 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 and that's just how we understood fukuyama from last week but uh fisher is saying it's not exactly the case where uh, whereas in fact it's sort of a warning because of that last bit right you know if you remember how last week i said there is the last bit right the end of history and something people usually just focus on the end of history but totally ignore the last bit which is uh you know the last man right and 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 mark fisher obviously picked up on that and saying this is another type of specter but this time is not the specter of marx but it's the specter of nietzsche because this idea of the last man is uh obviously is from nietzsche and I believe this is Nietzsche's own words, where uh, what uh, w which Fisher quoted: right? "Dangerous mood of irony, detached spectatorialism, replacing replacing engagement and involvement." It's kind of difficult to understand what this means, but if you remember how he, how I explained last week what the last man means, you know, somebody who shows no contempt, no tendency to complain about anything, even if the situation is bad and it's loses all kinds of uh motivation or whatever kind of like this character kind of like this character that i really like uh Kuretama. i like i like i like him precisely for this reason you know he's 
he's got no motivation he's he's got no aspiration or ever to change anything he he he's sort of the last man because he's he's sort of he's not happy he's not happy with the with the current situation but he doesn't want to do anything to change the current situation either which is what which is the Nietzschean last man and also what this cousin is like right you know when you remember the uh you know this cousin when when he's asked uh you know what is the purpose of you keeping all this art right why do you why do you do it and uh, he just says i don't i don't care i just don't think about it right i just don't think about it you just do it and uh that you know so this guy is sort of like the last man as well and if you have seen the film even clive owen's character is sort of like the last man as well like he used to be we we know from the film that he used to be the activist but then he's not anymore and he takes on this i mean even this this is this is why i like this opening scene a lot this is something i didn't explain right the rest you know you see everyone else is looking at the see looking at the screen right looking at the tragedy of this you know, baby Diego, what's his name, it has died. So it's, it's tragedy. You see how oh, they, they're all very sad or whatever. But then you have this person here yeah, that just, you know, doesn't give a shit. Yeah, he looks up. He looks up, right? He, he looks up, but then, you know, he's aware of this, but he, he doesn't give a shit. He just gets his coffee and gets a move on. And ironically, it's, it is because of his indifference that has saved him from, from the explosion. So, I don't know. Being the last man has has his perks, I guess. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so it's a mirror image of Frederick Jameson's uh, pastiche and revivalism. So not just the idea of the last man, but you know the whole idea of of you know how the new and the old you know, collapsing together, time being out of joint, uh, you know, anachronistic things happening everywhere in culture all those things the kind of what Frederick Jameson has commented on like the pastiche uh, but not quite Jameson's postmodernism he he's very he's he's made it very clear that he he doesn't identify himself as a postmodernist whatever that means because we know postmodernism is something that we can't really define that's the whole point right? that's the whole point of of the postmodern because you can't define it kind of like uh, you know kind of like Derrida's whole project which is why you get people like jordan peterson usually quoting derrida without actually quoting derrida which which is kind of his problem like he, he takes on this pseudo authority and he's, he's citing all these stuff but then when you actually listen to him he, he isn't actually saying anything so, i don't know um so Fisher is saying I prefer the term capitalist realism to postmodernism. So you can you can sort of see because this because he gives you the right he gives you the he gives you the permission to do this right. You could you could swap postmodernism with capitalist realism, although they're not the same thing, but they're sort of similar uh, for three reasons. Right. So he doesn't he doesn't see his idea of capitalist realism as postmodernism for three reasons. One uh, is. Uh, this uh, this phrase right there is no alternative which is the second part of the of the of the book's title right capitalist realism is there no alternative and this phrase there is no alternative is actually a phrase uh famously associated with margaret thatcher and uh actually why is it one of the reasons I guess postmodernism is is presented as an alternative, right? But then he's he's focusing on the on the very fact that there is there is no longer an alternative. Capitalism is the only thing that we could do right now. So even even if we because if you think about other postmodernists that we've covered, right, even postmodern artists or postmodern architects or or who or whatever, right? They have this choice. They could they could take on the style or they could just, you know, give up on the style they could do something else there is still uh, a choice but here uh, Fisher is focusing on the on on the idea that there is no alternative um, I actually found a clip I haven't found the clip where Thatcher specifically says there is no alternative but I have found another clip where Thatcher says something else quite interesting but I don't think I have enough time to play that maybe I'll upload that to Moodle is uh, it explains uh, neoliberal 
uh, neoliberalism, basically. So I think that's very that's very useful. But uh, I'll, 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 maybe I'll play it at the end. Uh, the second reason is um, the idea of modernism, because post modern you, you add the post to modernism. So even even though we, I mean, we keep saying we keep saying that post modernism isn't a movement, it isn't a time period that comes after modernism, but it must have some relationship with it, right? Otherwise, we won't call it post modernism. Otherwise, we we call it something else, right? Uh, we'll call it something else entirely. So it has a a a connotation to something else kind of resonating with the first point of the alternative right there is a something else there but then it's it, there isn't um and then third one this is kind of interesting there's a there is no outside anymore there's no outside for 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 colonization for appropriation or as i understand it there is there, there are no enemies anymore i think these three points are sort of the same point right the enemy obviously the enemy being russians if you, you know or whatever or in you know, the Soviet Union or whatever, you know, if you look at it from the Cold War's perspective, you know, or the fall of the Berlin Wall would be, you know, communism, kind of the same thing. It kind of happened at the same time, the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that kind of thing. The enemy is now gone. There's no enemy anymore. It's like there is this boxer dude there and in the ring waiting to punch someone, but then the enemy is already dead, but the match isn't finished yet. So, <laughs> he he just keeps jumping and there's there's nothing else to do, right? That that's the that's the sort of point that he's he's making here. I think these three points are sort of the same point now that I look at it. I don't know why I split them into three. So yeah, my future self probably uh, <laughs> probably delete these three points and just su summarize them into one. Um, it would be dangerous. So let's look at this long quote. That it would be dangerous and misleading to imagine that the near past. Uh, was well, some pre-lapsarian state rife with political potentials so it's as well to remember the role of uh, the role that com commodification played in the production of culture throughout the 20th century what we are dealing with now is not the incorporation of materials that previously seemed to possess subversive potentials but instead their pre-corporation uh, witness for uh, for instance the establishment of settled alternative or independent cultural zones which endlessly repeat older gestures of rebellion and contestation as if for the first time. I think this is a very important point. For, as if for the first time, but it actually has happened before. Alternative and independent don't, de don't designate something outside mainstream culture. Rather, they are styles, in fact, the dominant styles within the mainstream. Um... So the mainstream, because so I would add this, you know, to sort of make this long quote more easily understandable. I would add, I would, I would extend this quote to to say that the mainstream now becomes ironically the minority, and then the minority now becomes the mainstream, but without people realizing it. Uh, Fisher's example is Kurt Cobain. Uh, it's probably hard to explain because not even not even I am familiar with Kurt Cobain even though he's sort of in my era although I was I was too young to have listened to Kurt Cobain's music so I can't I can't really tell but you know, the, if you have read the reading you probably un you you understand what this means and I'll 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 tell you some other examples as well um to so Kurt Cobain the notoriety of Kurt Cobain as a as a musician is that he he's rebellious right he's the other he's he's not mainstream he doesn't follow rules or whatever right that's his image but the funny thing is that he knows that this is this is his image, and he can't do anything else. He can't. He can't. He's rebellious, but he can't. Re, he he can't rebel the rebellious nature. I, I I think that's that's sort of the 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 right way to explain this because th this rebellious s image is what the the record companies or whatever is is what is how they shaped it, right? So now that becomes the norm. So you know, so so. To, this look, I mean, he looks like a, the rebellious type, but he's actually conforming to a sort of norm. But it's, the norm just takes on a different look. I don't know whether you understand it or not. My example would be uh, cult films. Like you have heard of this term, the cult films. How how people, uh, you know, generally say, "Oh, this is a film that I like." It's it. Oh, it's a cult film. A cult film with by by definition, a cult film means it's it's a film that is otherwise 
lesser known. It's not a popular film. It's not in the mainstream, but it has attracted a certain amount of people, a, a certain following. Right, so a small-ish group of people uh, like the film, um, but people start to abuse this term, right, the cult, the cult film, and even call uh, people like Quentin Tarantino's films you know, as as cult films. But if you think about it, lots of people like Tarantino's work. So doesn't that make that mainstream? Like, if you have the majority of people like, if you have the majority of people liking something, then doesn't that make that mainstream? Um, because for something to be cult, it has to be minority, right? It has to be unpopular by definition. But then, if it's something that's very popular, then is it is it is it cult anymore? And I put Hong Kong there as an example. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking when I was writing these um, notes. But I was thinking more in terms of uh, the political environment and all those things. I'm not going to make any more further comments i'll just let you guys' imagination run right what run wild especially when you look at this uh quote here repeating old gestures of rebellion and contestation as if for the first time i think there's something very useful to be got out of that when you think about hong kong's political environment i'll just yeah i'll just put it there i'll just stop it there um in another chapter, I think it's his chapter two of uh, of the Capitalist Realism book, The Case of Wally. -E, um, the similar sort of contradiction is going on, like the contradiction of Kurt, Kurt Cobain, like how he's the rebellious type, but he's the rebellious nature is actually the norm, right? Or the cult film being, but the cult the cult film is actually the popular film. Um, Wally -E has has a similar sort of thing going on but it's slightly more 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 uh, uh, complicated I don't have a particular clip that I can show but I guess I could just show you like you know how Wally -E depicts you know the futuristic world again you see futuristic world but here it is very futuristic you see everybody in wheelchairs Essentially, <laughs> in wheelchairs, they have lost the the use of the legs, and you know it's there is this big corporation called By and Large, and basically it's this corporation being the sole uh, organization responsible to look after the human race because the, the the premise of the film is that Earth has been destroyed by environmental issues or whatever, so Earth is no longer suitable for people to for people to live. Uh, and so they have to build this massive uh, airship type of thing and then you, you have sort of like a uh, Noah's Ark type thing you know you have a massive airship and everybody on earth we have to be we have to be we have to be on board on, on, on this uh, spaceship where they, they have sustainable power they can have they, they can generate their own food or whatever and it's it's all done by this large corporation called by and large right and uh, where's my notes I think other, rather than looking at his looking at his explanation I think it's there's because as I was skimming through this film just uh, just before class I, I I noticed this bit that's very that's very useful so let me just let me just play you that by and large everything you need to be happy your day is very important to us. Hey, drink Here, take the cup. Hey, take the cup. This is this is not the this is not the bit. Uh, slightly later than this, I think. Oh, there you go, there you go. A is for Axiom, your home sweet home. B is for by and large, your very best friend. So you see what's what's what the film is doing there, right? It's uh, these babies are learning their ABCs, right? But in, in instead of A being Apple or A being Alpha, the the more adult version, <laughs> Alpha Bravo, or uh, I don't I don't remember what the C stands for. What is C? 
I know C is for cat, right? But that's that's it. That's for babies, right? C is for I can't remember. Anyway, so here they have an entirely different version. Again, someone in the chat, C for Charlie. Oh yeah, I think so. yeah, Charlie Delta Echo. You know, <laughs> that's the more that's the more adult version, right? But then here they have this entirely different version, right? A is for Axiom. Uh, I believe Axiom is like uh, another sort of corporate type thing that happens in this universe like this this thing that that by and large also does i think it's like a software or something it's a, maybe it's the software that that their wheelchair is running sort of like google i don't know I, I as far as i can remember the last time i saw it is it was a very long time ago but i mean you can sort of see it right the, the a in the axe which is why i like putting on subtitles when i when i watch the films even though i know english right but you know sometimes maybe you have difficulty hearing just one or two lines then subtitles will be there to save you and also you see some little details right you see the a is being capitalized it must mean it's 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 name of something axiom is the oh wow alicia. <laughs> alicia you're the fan you're a fan of this film or something because I can't remember. I quite like this film when it came out, but then I, the last time I saw it, probably like many, many years ago. It's right on the screen. Seriously, it's right on the screen. Huh. It probably not. It's not in this frame. I don't think. But okay, fair enough. Very, very good uh, observation skill. So it's right, right there on the on the screen. It tells you that the spaceship is called Axiom. So again, it's something that this large corporation is doing. A is for Axiom. Uh, and then B. Oh, that's true. Yeah, the line says your home sweet home. So that kind of, by definition, that means that implies that Axiom is the spaceship. So. My bad. I was thinking, uh, you know, my brain's not functioning properly. Uh, B is for by and large the this um, what do they call that in America? You have this, uh, you know, this like, target or no, not target. I'm not thinking of target. It's it's the other. It's the other thing. Uh, you know, you have this large shop. The, the shop before Amazon, basically. Again, inevitably, some of you from the from the chat would tell me, "Oh, is the screen weirdly flashing or any flashing?" Yeah, Walmart. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one I'm thinking of. Walmart. Walmart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's not flashing. Yeah, it's not flashing for me. So I don't know. Maybe I can stop share and start share again. Um. Anyway, yeah. Any technical issues you encounter? That's, do let me know. Yeah, guess your laptop got some problems. I, I don't know. Maybe it's time to get a new one. Get a more expensive one, you know, because by expensive, it must mean that it's good, right? Um, or maybe you've got the most expensive one, and then now it, it's developed uh, this problem, and then now you realize the most expensive one doesn't mean the best quality. Anyway, so, you know, the, the film does this thing, right, where it's obviously it's making a jab at this whole sort of capitalist you know corporate you know kind of critique right but yeah so this is this is the point that 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 fisher has has picked up right um okay so let's just read this uh, subjugation no longer takes the form of a subordination to an extreme of an extrinsic spec uh, spectacle but rather invites us to interact and participate uh it's attacking his own audience. Yeah, so apparently, according to Fisher, some supposedly right-wing observers criticized the film and 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 said that the film is basically attacking his own audience, right? Attacking the audience in the way that, you know, we, it, it's saying that we'll, we'll all become like this. We'll all become like, you know, very fat and we, we, we lose our function of the legs or whatever. We, we become, we become uh, you know, rubbish, basically. And uh, for some, for some people, they they don't really like this film's depiction of how they're mocking the, the audience, basically, because it, it has that message, that environmental protection message behind the film, right? You know, if it, it, it's it's so, it, the the implication is that if you don't start saving the environment, this is the reality that we'll we'll be left with, right? We will have this very high tech, a very high tech spaceship where we, where I mean, if you like that sort of thing, maybe you, maybe you want to damage even more the environment. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe they've done, maybe they've, they've, uh, they've outdone themselves when they put that message there. I don't know. Um, so for me, I mean, after reading, uh, 
Fisher's critique of the critique of of this capitalist critique, right? It's very postmodern, right? The film itself is already critiquing something, but then you have something you have someone else to critique the critique, right? You know, it's kind of like question the question, right? Uh, for me, it's sort of like a, 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 a an anti propaganda or a, a different kind of propaganda, a very subtle kind of propaganda. The film performs the anti capitalism, right? It's I mean that that moment there when they when when the teachers or the robot here is the robot the robot teacher teaches the babies the 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 letters of the alphabet and all they could come up with is any is everything related to this large corporation right the establishment as it were right so it's very clearly the film is doing the anti-capitalist sentiment for us but then it, it what it all it does is to allow us to continue to consume it but with impunity so what that means is so long as we believe in our hearts that capitalism is bad we are free to continue to participate in it and continue to be uh complicit or not even complicit because we're not we don't have the we don't have the agency to participate in anything we're just there to observe to take in all the kind of like what these people are doing there in their wheelchairs they can't move they can only move where the wheelchairs take them to move like you, you see the you see the blue lines there so all these wheelchairs they can only move along the along the blue lines right? and then when when an accident happens you know they, they all get jammed up there and then the new blue line appears and the, the wheelchairs will follow the new blue line uh, it kind of resonates with the 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 term spectate spectatorship that we mentioned earlier. I I kind of realized when I said spectatorship earlier on in one of the points that I was making, I didn't I didn't really explain what that means. Right? It's not the normal. It's not spectatorship in the normal context. Right? It's not like us watching a film. That's usually how we define spectatorship. Right? But this sort of passive participation in the capitalist culture that's that's what that is that is what spectatorship in uh, in the previous points i can't find it anymore uh that's what it means right and uh yeah so he extends this sentiment you know this this sort of anti it has a sort of i don't know rev, almost like revolutionary gesture there it's, it's but it's it has done the anti-capitalism for us that so we don't have to be anti-capitalism ourselves right we can we can continue to be the last man basically um he extends that observation to these sort of charity events like live aid and live aid and, uh, the, the original live aid and the life aid i believe it's like the eighth iteration of this of this uh you know concert event and they, they called it life eight instead of aid and it's supposed to be um you know the idea the idea is that you have these bunch of like musician bands or whatever they just come and perform the songs and they and people donate and and by that simple act it will end poverty it will end poverty right it will end poverty in africa basically africa being the other and you know all that kind of stuff also product red as well uh you know there is very clear distinction of the us and them you know and you know we are doing this good, we are doing this bit we we have done this good thing there by purchasing a product red product and uh, we, we we have done the good bit by donating to the live eight events the live eight musicians or whatever so we've done we've done it so we don't have to do it properly right i don't know whether you see that sentiment kind of similar to this anti-capitalism thing you know because the film has already done the anti-capitalism thing we don't have to do it ourselves they kind of like these charity events uh product reds product reds well, i can't i can't speak today product reds punk rock or hip-hop character cons consisted in his realistic acceptance that capitalism is the only game in town again the same sentiment of there is no alternative no, the aim was only to ensure that some of the proceeds, not all of them, just just some of them, some of the proceeds of uh, the transactions went to good causes. Uh, the fantasy being that Western consumerism, uh, far from being intrinsically implicated in systematic or systemic global inequalities, could itself solve them. Right, so it, product red would be the perfect example. Right, to use the problem to solve the problem basically uh 
rather than acknowledging that there is global inequalities, it's it's actually they 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 believe that it's the very thing that can solve the problem in the first place. And all we have to do is to buy the right product, right? All we have to do is to trust in by and large, right, in in the world of Wally, -E, or trust Amazon or whatever, or a Walmart or you know whatever large corporation that you can think of. Um. Yeah, so maybe yeah, maybe we still have time. So maybe just let me show you that uh, Margaret Thatcher clip. Not this one, actually. Uh, oh, I should probably meant. Oh, there's so many extra comments that I want to make. Maybe show you the Margaret Thatcher one first. Margaret Thatcher. There is no alternative. There is no alternative. Yeah, it's only two minutes. Let's just just have a listen to this. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error... No, th no, this isn't the one, no. Uh, hang on. Ah, this one. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. There is no doubt that the Prime Minister has in many ways achieved substantial success. The yeah. 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 There, is, there is one statistic that I understand is not, however, challenging. And that is that over her 11 years, the gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. How can she say at the end of her chapter of British politics that she can justify many people in a constituency such as mine being relatively much poorer off much less well housed and much less well provided than it was in 1979. Surely she accepts that is not a record that she or any Prime Minister can be proud of. Mr Speaker, all levels of income are better off than they were in 1979. You recognise that's very Fukuyama, right? Fukuyama has made a similar point, right? All incomes has, in, has been better off when they were, uh, better than they were before. But what the Honourable Member is saying is that he were rather the poor were poorer, yeah, yeah. provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services as we have. And what a policy. Yes, he would rather have the poor poorer. Provide you may think he's not, uh, she's not making sense here. At, at first, I would, I, would, I would feel like that as well, as, as probably you guys would probably have a similar sentiment. I mean, you guys are being university students, which are by definition usually left-leaning, so you would have that sort of understanding, like Thatcher's talking rubbish there. But wait, wait until she does something else. That is a liberal policy. Yes, it came out. He didn't intend it to, but he did. Way to the, I give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm extremely, I'm extremely grateful. The, the, the Prime Minister is aware that uh, I detest every single one of her domestic policies and I've never had that. And I think that the honourable gentleman knows that I have the same contempt for his socialist policies as the people of East Europe who have experienced it have it for that. I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poorer. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. <laughs> Down here. That. Not that. But that. So long as the gap is smaller, so long as the gap is smaller, They'd rather have the poor poorer. You do not right. I don't know how much you catch. You could catch that you know, the hand gesture there, but it's it's the visualization of the gap is what is. I think is quite clever. You know, it, it kind of it convinces me. Right. You know, the the liberal policy being because what what Thatcher stands for is obviously is neoliberalism. So this kind of explains what neoliberalism is. Right? To to. Uh, to be okay with this thing called the the, the the wealth gap, right? And she kind of explains the wealth gap in a in a different perspective, which is very postmodern, right? If you want to take a postmodern approach to look at a, a debate, right? This is what you need to do. There's a certain belief that you have, but then you look at the opposite side of the, the debate and then you combine that to to make the uh, dialectic synthesis right so which is a very marxian 
where you have the thesis and the antithesis you combine them together to make the to make the synthesis and this is what i'm trying to do here when when she when she gestures the wealth gap right initially initially is like this right the gap is pretty big there's this is the poor the poorest person this is the richest person the gap is pretty big but she's saying that in order to narrow the gap you won't do you won't bring the you won't automatically bring the the, the poor up to to narrow the gap in order to narrow the gap you don't you don't even you don't even do this but you actually you actually do do this right to bring the poorer even poorer that's the only way to reduce the gap right she hasn't quite explained this in 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 quite sort of graphical way but she attempts she attempted to do this i don't know how i don't know how much of that you understood right so it's not it's not just a matter of narrowing the gap because by narrowing the gap it's it will autom it will inevitably bring the poor to even poorer so it's like everybody loses that's basically what the conservatives it, it's the conservative belief right the 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 socialist belief would be that the the gap definitely the gap needs to be narrow right it's it's very unfair right how you have the one percent of people jeff bezos or whatever the owner of by and large right <laughs> owner of owner of amazon obviously but owner of by and large in in, in wally how he can have the one percent how how he can be so high up and how we are all like here it's the the gap doesn't seem very fair so obviously you have to narrow it but in order to narrow that so that's the that's the conservative's point of view right in order to narrow it you don't just bring them down or even by bringing them down it, it's kind of unfair for these people right no, not me i'm not pointing at me but for the for the for the rich right even even if these people stay at that you if you just bring them down it would be unfair to them that, i mean this this argument i think you're all familiar with right but Thatcher is saying something something else, right? By by bringing them down, you also bring these people down as well. So there's there's no winner by narrowing the the, the wealth gap. I don't know. I guess this is part of the reason why Thatcher was uh, well, she wasn't well, she was popular for fifty percent of the population, or around about fifty percent. That's how politics work, which is why I hate politics because there's no there's no way to resolve anything. It's always is always fifty percent versus the other fifty percent, but I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I just I just look at it from um, from the point of view of I don't know maybe complete. It's a very complete way of looking at things, like how he how she's presenting a a different argument, and they both make sense. I think you know the narrowing the gap obviously makes sense, but by narrowing the gap it it brings it it, it results in uh, they they both lose in the end. I think that also makes sense. So it's it's kind of interesting uh another uh comment that i would l want to make is uh, the film ready player one um i almost wanted to make ready player one as the as the main text to look at uh not just for this film but also for um n not just for this week but also for for the f postmodern film week obviously and uh, for for good reason but you know this i i think i mean if you're familiar with this film or you can just maybe check it out on netflix or whatever and think about the the points that mark fisher has made about how the new and the old just sort of jumbled together and you you see you see this happening in in the film and particularly in in the bit where the where the, the shining bit if you if you if you have seen the film you see the shining bit it's it sort of it it, do, it 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 robs me in the wrong way. Like it's appropriating the the shining in, in uh, it it sort of imposes a sort of superiority. Like how if you have seen the shining, if you are familiar with the shining, then you are obviously better. You have this other character who hasn't seen the shining because it's it's supposed to be a horror film. Although it's it's not a horror film by conventional standards. You don't really get to see that many like horrific scenes i mean there's no jump scares for for instance there may be actually yeah like the blood and stuff the old woman all those things they could, yeah you could count them as jump scares it's just slower jump scares so not quite as jumpy as the normal jumps anyway but you know and you know they introduce like new aesthetics like they, they they put in the zombies there in the in the shining bit there this is what this film has done so it, it kind of i don't know 
if you imagine people who haven't seen The Shining and coming into this film and watching that bit about The Shining and, and you think about these uh, points that Mark Fisher has made, then you may arrive at some interesting observation. I can't really show you that bit because I'd quite like to show you another bit which is more relevant to my own research interests and very relevant to the points that we, we have made today. Uh, I don't know. Back to the, the first film, Back to the Future 1. I don't know whether you guys know this film or not, but uh, you have uh, Marty McFly, the, the character played by played by this dude, uh, Michael J. Fox. Uh, so inadvertently, he's, he's... So the setting is 1985, and then inadvertently he was sent back to 1955. Right in the time machine, he he in a time machine, obviously the DeLorean, and he 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 doesn't want it. Obviously, he he didn't want to 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 time travel. He was it was just an accident. But then he's now stuck in 1955 when he met up with his parents, right? And uh, of co of course, the parents 30 years younger, obviously, so way before way before he was born. And the crisis the crisis appears when his would-be father and he and his would-be mother they don't seem to get along they don't seem to be together where whereas in the actual history or in his version in in marty's version of the history they they should have fallen in love uh at the when when he arrived in 1955 but because he he's done something else different he's done he's done something differently that changed the history and now his his father and his mother are no longer together hence the implication being he will no longer be he will no longer exist it's just a very sort of common time travel uh trope right and then in this pivotal scene you see uh the the near the end of the film uh, there is uh this 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 uh prom this school prom kind of thing a school dance uh enchantment under the sea i think some of you who are familiar with this with this film would probably know what this is enchantment under the sea dance and apparently their parents first kissed in this dance hence uh cementing their their relationship right so so if they don't kiss in this dance then marty will cease to exist and this is what happened. Hey, guys, you gotta get back in there and finish the dance. Hey, man, look at Marvin's hand. He can't play with his hand like that, and we can't play without him. Yeah, well, look, Marvin. Marvin, you gotta play. See, that's where they kiss for the first time on the dance floor. And if there's no music, they can't dance. If they can't dance, they can't kiss. If they can't kiss, they can't fall in love, and I'm history. Hey, man, the dance is over. <laughs> unless uh, you know somebody else that can play the guitar. So obviously he he plays the guitar himself. Earth angel, earth angel, will you be mine? My darling dear, love you. George, aren't you gonna kiss me? I I don't know. Obviously their parents. The father is sort of like what you would call a wussy, so he doesn't have the courage to steal his girl back, essentially. So he's disappearing.
This is, uh, this is an oldie, but, uh, well, it, it's an oldie where I come from. Obviously, because this is 1955 and he's right, from guys, 1985. Blues riff B. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? So a bit of con, a, a bit of context, right? The the song before, talking about songs, we we began with songs and we end with songs as well in this in this lecture. The the first song was uh, Earth Angels, I think that's what the song was called. The song released in 1955, exactly, bang on 1955, Earth Angels. And this is 1955, right? And this other song that Marty is playing now, he says is an oldie, uh, Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry. That song came out in 1958, so three years after this moment, so they wouldn't have heard this song before. So he's improvising now. It's no longer Johnny Be Good. The, the original Johnny Be Good isn't isn't like this. Obviously. And now he's doing something very 1980s. Like the trashing of the set. The outlandish guitar solo. It's all very 80s or late 70s. So in, anyway, way ahead of his time, right? Obviously, we all enjoyed it. Or at least I, I did. You guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are going to love it. Yeah, exactly. Your kids are going to love it, but you guys can't, can't accept it. So you see, I don't know. I don't know how, how resonating this scene is to... Like some of the points we made, especially in, in, in regards to music, like with the Valerie track by uh, Amy Winehouse, Mark Ronson. This is the this is the thing that reminds me of. Right. You have this is this. The moment here is 1955. This, the song, the futuristic song that he plays is from 1958. So only three years off. So they still accept it. Right. And then there's this joke that, you know, Chuck Berry has this image, this uh, fictional cousin. Chuck, Chuck is Marvin, your cousin, Marvin Berry. <laughs> so obviously he's, he's calling Chuck Berry, the Chuck Berry. Like yeah, you're looking for a new sound. This is the new sound you're looking for. Right? So it's playing on a joke that Chuck Berry never wrote the song, but it's actually Marty who gave the idea, you know, that cyclical cause and effect thing that is very popular in, in time travel narratives. So it's just a side joke, but it, the acceptance of the audience, right? The, the audience definitely accepts this. 1958 song so it's not very futuristic even though it's it, even though it comes from the future in in the 1955's perspective but then as soon as he does something that's way ahead of his time right which is the the guitar solo and the trashing of the set of all those things all those sort of 1970s 80s sort of thing right then they no longer enjoy it because it's so ahead of his time and this thing this shock right is what Mark Fisher is saying that it's no longer possible for us, for us living in uh, one. Well, it may not be twenty twenty one, but with, at, by, by the time he, he wrote those things, right, sort of in the twenty tens, it's already happening 
it was already happening back then in the 2010s when you don't you don't see this thing anymore nothing can shock us anymore so no matter how like a future marty right if if you have someone coming from 2046 or something you have someone coming from 2046 playing a 2046 song they probably can't shock us that this reminds me of another film. I don't know whether if you are familiar, if you are interested in this sort of time travel, very fantastical. I mean, obviously, I'm the time travel expert, right? so I can I can show you some stuff. Uh, there's this film called. Uh, I'm sorry, we're way past time, but this is something very interesting. So I mean, I can see most of you are still with me, so I I, I suppose you are you are interested in this in this topic. Uh, there's this film called Hot Tub Time Machine, uh, 2010 film, and uh, they're doing they're doing something. That, Obviously, they're riffing off this this very scene when they did their very own take of playing a futuristic song to a to a past audience, and the song they used was Black Eyed Peas. Uh, what's that song called? Uh, Let's get it started. Or, although Let's get it started is like the remix of the original song, which is Let's get retarded. But nobody knows that song. We only know the Let's get it started. I probably should have played that at the beginning. <laughs> I very I like that song very much. So it, it plays on that sort of it plays on this very same idea how this futuristic sound is shocking the the past audience. But Mark Fisher is saying the entire opposite, right? This the shock is no longer possible because the future is cancelled. There's no more future. There's no more futuristic music. Like the music we have now is like like it's not just it's not it's not even the pinnacle i mean look at the the valerie song by amy winehouse it's even it's re this the regress like I, I keep doing this right there's progress and the regress right this we are living in the time of regress basically although i can i can sort of make a counter argument to this like i some of you are more interested in it more into music and maybe find some uh, counter arguments and can argue against Mark Fisher's observation and say that music has indeed progressed and there has been new sounds uh, since his death basically in 2017 maybe there are some more new sounds there but I mean I mean you, you see my uh, uh, my choice of the, the Dua Lipa album right at week one right even that the whole album plays on this very same idea of there is no future shock anymore the future or future, the future comes from nostalgia, right? Hence the title, future nostalgia. Everything points to that same idea. Anyway, so this is the end. But I'm very sorry we we uh, went way past the the designated time. But uh, anyway, enjoy your dinner, enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you next week for the final lecture.